Hello, and um, welcome to, to watching this uh, short interview with uh, Professor David Hurd, a Professor of Modern Literature here at the School of English at the University of Kent. Um, we're here to talk about um, a project David has been involved with for a number of years called uh, Refugee Tales, which was recently made into a unit of work for Key Stage 3 uh, produced by the Oak Academy. And I'm very much looking forward to discussing the project and this latest development with David over the course of this short video. So David, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Yuha. Um, um, just to kind of get us started, first of all, would you mind just telling us a little bit about what Refugee Tales is and how the project came about? Sure, okay. So uh, Refugee Tales is, to quote, a walk in solidarity with refugees, asylum seekers and detainees. So every summer since 2015, Refugee Tales has gone on uh, a long walk, several days at a time. It's a linear walk. We stop over as we walk. And everywhere we stop on these walks, mostly across Southern England, sometimes through London, everywhere we stop, we share the stories of people who have experienced immigration detention in the United Kingdom. So these are the stories of people who typically have fled some country, have been forced to leave some country, for all the kinds of reasons that we're very aware of these days uh, to do with war and uh, sort of uh, all, all kinds of political breakdown, all kinds of persecution. They fled that country, they've come to the UK, they've sought asylum here, and then in seeking asylum, they found themselves caught up in the UK's immigration processes. And at some point in that process, they found themselves detained. And uh, sad to say, uh, embarrassingly to say, indefinitely detained because the UK is the only country in Europe, as it turns out, that detains people indefinitely under immigration rules. Now, the, the Refugee Tales project grows out of the work of a charity, uh, an NGO, called Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group. And Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group, for 20 years now, has been visiting people detained in this fashion at the detention centres at Gatwick Airport. There are 10 detention centres around the country. Uh, two of them are at Gatwick Airport. Um, and the, the impulse behind the project, and I got involved, uh, I was involved right from the beginning, was simply to, firstly, to make known the fact that the UK has this policy, which is an infringement of human rights by any measure, okay? Um, so firstly, to make that policy known, but then also, uh, and crucially, to share the stories of people who had experienced that process of detention, because we really felt very strongly that A, those stories should be out there in the world, okay? Uh, because these are real lived experiences that, uh, that, that, people, uh, that, that, that people were not being able to talk about. But also we felt very strongly that if views on this were to change, if the politics of this was to change, then the best way to make that change was to share the stories of people who had experienced the detention in the first place. Um, and uh, we, um, we faced a very complicated problem right from the beginning, which was that for many people who are in this position, um, they, are, they, they remain at risk. They remain at various kinds of risk. They're at risk um, in relation to the, the, the situation they fled from. Um, they're at risk also, unfortunately to say, in relation to uh, the Home Office and its policies in this country. And so it was important to find a way of sharing these stories, which didn't then, as it were, compromise or threaten uh, the individual security. So we started off um, by, uh, by telling these stories in a kind of collaborative way, a, uh, a series of uh, very established, successful um, writers worked in collaboration with the person whose story is being told. There would be conversations between the writer and that person, everything in the in the tale, therefore, would come directly out of the person's experience. But it would be mediated to the world um, through the writer's telling, as it were. It was a co-production, um, and as I say, the reason for the co-production was to protect people's identity where that was necessary. As the project has gone on, and as we've always intended that it would, and as the project has kind of created a safe space for these stories to be shared, then people have uh, increasingly shared their own stories. Um, and so there are, now, there are now three volumes of refugee tales. And the third of those volumes uh, um, contains a, a whole mix of stories, stories told in this collaborative co-production way and stories told in the first person, as it were, uh, uh, testimonies from lived experience. And so we walk 
and we share the stories wherever we go the events are free and open to the public and then we've communicated the stories through through the books and then gradually the project has kind of developed all kinds of other uh, kind of iterations and incarnations and so we we are sharing stories wherever we go so that's a long answer to your first question you but no that's that's, that's marvelous thank you would you, you mind just telling us a little bit about what kinds of our uh, writers and artists have taken part in the projects um over the course of the years yeah so we've um many 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 writers now have been involved in the in the project uh i should i would like to mention two writers who uh, from very early on have given great support to the project and uh and then and then became patrons of the project uh one is uh, abdul razak gurna who uh who until recently uh, was a professor in the school of english at the university of kent and his is himself uh, an internationally acclaimed uh, novelist um, and so Abdul Razak, uh, Abdul Razak wrote one of the very first tales for us. Um, and then actually very interestingly, so we wrote, he wrote a, a tale for our first volume um, in, so he wrote and read in 2015. And then we, uh, for our third volume, we went back to Abdul Razak to see if he would write a follow-up tale because uh, five years on at that point, the person whose story he told in 2015 um, that person's circumstance hadn't changed in any way, and we wanted to mark this fact by those two tellings. So it's very important to mention Abdul Razak Gurna, but also extremely important to mention uh, Ali Smith, uh, the, the writer, the, the, uh, the uh, acclaimed and wonderful writer, Ali Smith, who has uh, who, uh, who shared a story with us from the very beginning, to told a story for us called The Detainee's Tale. Um, very powerful story, very, very, uh, it was published by The Guardian in 2015. Uh, well worth uh, seeking out because it says so clearly uh, what the project is trying to do and what the circumstances that we are trying to address. Um, but Ali Smith has uh, has supported the project ever since. She's walked with us. She's uh, she's pr provided films for us. So uh, those two writers I would mention, but all kinds of uh, other writers. Um, so for instance, Caroline Bergval. Um, for instance, Jackie Kay. Um, for instance, Carmilla Shamsi, and then um, so I mean there are many, and it's uh, it's unfair in a way to, to mention particular to writers. But I would point out that in the in the forthcoming volume of Tales, so Volume Four, which will be published later this year, there's a new we are we are making a new departure. So there will be tales which will be uh, which be told from the British experience of detention, but we're also looking now to internationalize the project and share tales. Um, from other from experiences in other countries of the asylum the asylum systems that people find there so for instance there will be tales from the italian situation and from the canadian situation and the american situation and of course this is bringing new voices and new experiences um, uh, into the project all of the time and one of the things we're trying to observe is that detention is is an, an acute issue in in the united kingdom but it's not uh, it's not peculiar to the united kingdom and you don't have to read much news these days before you come across a story relating to detention. Sadly, it's a problem that uh, we all need to be thinking about. Yeah, so. marvelous, great, thank you for that. Um, and I think, you know, you, you, you've really kind of landed on, on, I think, a key point. So it's t talking about detention as a, as a point that we all need to be thinking about, which I think brings us quite nicely to this really excellent development with the, the Oak Academy. So um, could you just tell us a little bit more about um, how this unit of work uh, with um, Key Stage 3 in the Oak Academy kind of came about? And, and what do you hope students who undertake that unit might get out of it themselves. Okay, so uh, I was delighted, really delighted to learn that the that the Oak Academy had developed a unit around the refugee the refugee tales project and the refugee tales books. Uh, they we they they got I think as I remember they were in touch at a very early stage and then you know one thing led to another. We weren't much involved in it at all. They. Um, and the, the teacher who 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 leads the, the lessons on, on the on on the series of um, uh, broadcasts uh, has done has done wonderful research around the project. It's a it's a really exemplary presentation of what it is that we have been trying to do. One of the things that she does extremely well and, and it's very kind of gratifying is um, she she relates the books to the project all of the time. So so she communicates very clearly that these books, these stories come out of this larger community that is the Walking Project. 
Um, what uh, what the lessons do is they is they talk students through in a in a very careful and patient fashion the way the refugee tales project relates to uh, the project out of the, the the poem out of which in some ways it takes its influence and origin which is the Canterbury Tales so right from the beginning refugee tales was refer referencing the Canterbury Tales just as a poem uh, in which um, stories are shared and in which uh, and, and in which the very act of speaking and sharing stories and the act of making a poem comes out of human movement so from the very beginning um, it, the, the Canterbury Tales has been a, a model for us and so the the Oak Academy lessons they they make a clear they make clear comparisons between Canterbury Tales and refugee tales and then they um, they're, they're exemplary also in being very careful around the, the language that we have to use when trying to describe forced migration and displacement. So there's a very careful accounting of the different terms that, uh, that we need to think about uh, when we're thinking about people who have been compelled to move. So there are definitions of the word refugee and of the word migrant and of the word asylum seeker and uh, clear differentiations are made between those terms. There's a very clear account of um, the, the policy of detention uh, that, the, uh, that the UK operates and adopts. It's, um, it's a, I would say that there are, it's a brave series of lessons. So it's not, it doesn't flinch from articulating a point of view. And then there are two, there are two, there are, so there are four lessons in, uh, in total. Um, the final two are, are concerned with the power of stories. So the power of stories actually to change culture, raise awareness, and ultimately, I guess one would hope to change politics. And the, the lesson is very clear about that. And then the final, uh, the final lesson is concerned with uh, the question of what, uh, what the lesson calls tone and the kind of tone that the refugee tales project is and the and the volumes uh, are are trying to create uh to ex to be explicit about what that tone is uh, the project the the as a whole the books as a series are are, tr are trying to establish a tone of welcome we are trying to demonstrate always that people who have come to this country are welcome in this country um and so and the lessons do a really wonderful job of communicating this in a very straightforward language. So these are lessons that are aimed, as you say, uh, to uh, at, uh, they're aimed at key stage three students. So students uh, uh, ages 11 to 14. The, the language of the lessons is very straightforward, um, but the points, the points that are being made are complex and uh, they, they recognize all, the, all of the kind of difficulties that people uh, find themselves in in these circumstances. So uh, I would urge anyone 11 to 14, or I'm going to say a little bit older to go and to go and to go and look at those lessons because it's um it's a really exemplary account of uh, what it is that a project that is sharing stories is trying to do. Marvelous, great, thank you for that. It sounds so exciting, as you said, for um, students of any age. Really, I think would kind of gain a great deal from that. Yeah. Um, in your response to it, you 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 said a lot about the kind of the importance and the the power of stories, which um, really resonated with me because obviously it's something that. Um, here at the School of English, all of us very much believe in and, and, and kind of incorporate into our own sort of daily teaching within the kind of courses that we ourselves teach here at Kent. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. How do you think the kind of um, the power of stories that we get from refugee tales or the kind of ethos that the project um, demonstrates might speak towards the kind of undergraduate courses that we teach here with English at Kent? Yeah, I, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question and it's an important question. Um, I, I would venture the thought that refugee, refugee Tales as a project expresses something that is kind of crucial to the way we think about literature and the power of literature in the School of English at Kent. So we, um, we, we have always been very concerned to, uh, to give a, a clear sense of the, the, the history of English literature. Uh, we, we, we teach, well, I mean, we, we teach literature from Chaucer to the contemporary, we like to say. Refugee Tales captures Chaucer to the contemporary in a very uh, interesting way. But or as, we, as we teach and share that history of English literature and the literatures of English, because we aren't only talking about literature that's been, uh, that's been pr produced in, uh, in the UK, as we share those stories, we are always looking to observe 
how uh, an understanding of literature can help us to intervene on contemporary questions, how literature has enabled writers to intervene on their contemporary questions. And so, I mean, if we were to kind of specify a particular moment in our, in our program where, where these things intersect, uh, you and I, Yuha, we teach, on a, we teach on a module called the Contemporary, which is a second year module, which, uh, which is concerned with 21st century literature. And it's um, because the 21st century being what it is, that literature is largely uh, a literature of crisis or, as a, or a series of crises. Writers who are responding through story or poem or other uh, other kinds of literary modes to a very pressing circumstance in the world that we uh, the, that we are uh, find ourselves in today, Refugee Tales is trying to do that. Refugee Tales is harnessing the power of the story told by the individuals, the individual who has lived that story or co-produced by uh, writers who have taken a great interest in those stories, and it's and it's trying to show that. Uh, if we if we only listen to those stories carefully enough, if we are just attentive enough to what's being said to us, then that will uh, that can in and of itself motivate a desire for change and who knows perhaps an actual change. So I think that I, th I think that what what Refugee Tales is doing just to one side of the School of English actually really sort of articulates what the School of English as a whole is trying to do in 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 so many areas of its work. I think. I hope that sounds like a true reflection of what we're up to, Yuha. No, I think it absolutely does. I mean, I've said this a number of times in a number of different circumstances, but, you know, um, literature or writing and narratives very much shapes the world around us yeah, you know, and, 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 and does so on a multiple different levels. So when we engage with literature, we are always engaging with the world around us and therefore by thinking through literature is also a tool for us to think towards a well, a better world um, and, and, and to kind of think towards the kinds of problems we want to be solving in the world in which we find ourselves here at this critical moment and strange moment in the 21st century. Great. Um, thank you for that, David. Um, if you would like to find out more about Refugee Tales, about the Oak Academy unit on Refugee Tales or about our um, courses at the School of English here at Kent. Um, there's a couple of links in the, dis uh, in this, in the description. Uh, so have a look through, then click through. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and watching this. Thank you, David, for uh, joining us and giving us his insights on this matter. Um, hopefully see you again soon and take care.